The Mavericks have won seven games in a row, Luka's averaging a near 34-point triple-double since the All-Star break, all is normal in Dallas. Well, not quite, because as things currently stand, they're only two games away from the fifth seed, three games behind fourth, and the more they rise the ranks, the tougher it becomes to turn a blind eye to Luka's claim for MVP. I'm not sure we've ever seen a player capable of creating offense in the way that he has this season, and most of that starts in the pick and roll, a play as old as basketball itself. The idea was to find a way to create an advantage for ball handlers to attack by having a teammate screen the on-ball defender, turning what would be a one-on-one -on -one into a two-on-one -on -one that forces the defense to make tough decisions. Now, we've seen all sorts of different players from different eras take advantage of these actions in different ways. Guys like Magic or Stockton would often set up inside the arc and turn the corner either looking for a drive, mid-range jumper, or of course the pocket pass. Spacing back then was a lot different, and it wasn't until Steve Nash and the Suns came along that we got the first glimpse of what was to come. High ball screens, shooters spaced to both corners, and of course the ability to hit the pull-up three against softer coverages. Over time, these more spaced out looks became the norm. You've got Chris Paul and his relentless hunt for the mid-range, LeBron and his ability to read the low man, then counter any rotations with perfectly timed skip passes. James Harden's ability to get downhill and play a game of cat and mouse with opposing bigs. Don't help, it's an easy bucket, but step out even an inch and it's a lob. This led to tons of switching, and then the defense had to deal with Harden isolating a mismatch. Pretty much an opponent's worst nightmare. The reason I go through all of these transitional periods and various different ball handlers is because it all culminates in the form of Luka Doncic. He sort of feels like pick and roll's final boss, mastering each and every one of these qualities to the point where it seems like no coverage will work no matter how well it's executed. The most common coverage that teams will go to is a drop, but as one of the best off-the-dribble three-point shooters in the league, Luka's got the best counter. As a result, that point-of-attack defender is forced to hug him over the screen and take away that space, which leaves them either on his hip or trying to recover from behind, to which he'll utilize the mid-range. Or sometimes you'll even see him fake that more patient approach by positioning his body in a way that looks like he's gonna play in between, only to instead cut back to the three-point line for one of his outside jumpers. His ability to quickly process the defense when paired with that patience makes him feel unstoppable when attacking downhill. He uses his large frame to hold Hakez on his hip as he slowly works his way to the basket, and because Bam never commits to the ball, he's left with an easy floater. Here's another example. He gets that defender on his hip, finds a lane to attack down the middle, and when help slides down from the weak side, he uses a pass fake to clear the rim for a lay. Defenses can't just let him have whatever he wants as a driver, so once that big drops back, they're sort of forced to first play the ball. That means a third defender has to slide down to tag the roll, prompting Luka to fire a bullet to the corner as he creates an open three. Here's a real similar play, except this time as he attacks the middle and that weak side defender slides down, he stares down the corner before instead tossing it up to Gafford. And this is that game of cat and mouse I earlier referenced. Leave him with too much room and he's scoring, but try to take away that space in any way and he's floating in a perfectly placed lob. Look, I don't know about you, but I love saving money. Imagine if you could earn cash back on everyday things like gas, groceries, or going out to eat at a restaurant. So when my mom introduced me to the free Upside app, I was absolutely ecstatic. Even more so now that I'm partnering with them on this video. Upside is hired by over 50,000 businesses to market on their app, and they share that revenue with you by allowing you to earn cash back on daily essentials. It doesn't matter which of the 50 states you're in, these offers are available at over 100,000 locations. Just using my area as a reference, you can see that Casey's is offering 47 cents per gallon cash back. The Speedway, that's less than a two minute drive away, is offering 50 cents per gallon. And getting started is as easy as it gets. All you have to do is download the free Upside app and create an account, which shouldn't take any more than a minute. Then use the map function to look for any nearby cash back offers, tap claim on the one you want, and shop as usual. 
frequent upside users earn $340 in cash back a year. You can cash out your earnings whenever you want. And as a major bonus, they're also giving away $30,000 over the next 30 days. So why not get started as soon as possible? I've even got a little hookup for you guys. If you click the link in the description or scan the QR code on your screen, sign up and complete one purchase, you'll unlock a $10 gift card and earn a chance to win that major prize. If I were you, I wouldn't waste any time. This offer won't be around forever, so don't miss your chance to earn cash back when you shop with Upside. And with that said, let's take a look at some examples of what I mean when I say cat and mouse. Like I said, the first defender has to run him off the line, and that turns the play into a two-on-one. So what he'll do is attack the big and force him into committing to either him or the roller. And he's a master of disguising whatever it is he's going to do. Notice how he gets that defender on his hip, slowly works his way to the restricted area, and right here Wemby has to make a decision. Even while Luka gathers, you can't tell if it's a lob or a floater. Only when he releases the ball, and by then it's too late. Here it is again. Porzingis is dropping back as Luka drives right at him, and it's pretty much the exact same play as last time, only now instead of a lob, he follows through with the flow. In the same way you consistently hear about players leveraging their scoring into passing opportunities, he's a master of the inverse, staring down lively as he attacks the cup and making it look like someone laid out a red carpet to the rim. And like I said, he's a master of disguise, not just with the floater turned lob. Here's one where he extends his arm as if going to a finger roll, which of course ends up being the perfect setup. I think it's fair to say that it's probably in the defense's best interest to keep Luka as far away from the paint as possible. So what a lot of teams will do is go to that drop coverage, except with the big starting a lot closer to the level of the screen. Only, that puts them in a position to have to defend Luka in space, which is a lot easier said than done. Of course, when faced with a high drop, that still leaves him with enough room to comfortably set up those pull-up threes, and if the big commits, that opens up yet another way to create offense at the rim. Sometimes it feels like Luka's a puppet master that has the defense on strings. Miami's in a zone, so when he turns the corner he's left with a ton of room to get to a floater, but while going through the motions he recognizes that Jaquez is getting ready to sink and instead sends a heater to the corner for a great look from three. And here's one that starts with the high drop coverage I talked about, leaving this weak side defender in a two-on-one. Like clockwork, he's going to stare down the wing and lob it up to the big. Whether it's using his eyes, masking his delivery, faking a shot, pretty much everything he does is manipulating the defense in some way. Even here, it's so subtle. Vassell has to play the two-on-one, and by simply looking to the wing for just a second as he makes the pass, that's all it takes to create an easy dunk for Gafford. Actually, I really want to talk about Daniel Gafford for a second because I don't know if you heard, but he made 33 straight shots over a span of 5 games. He was only 3 more makes away from breaking Wilt Chamberlain's record, and in the one game Luka missed, it only took 30 seconds for the streak to end. Now I don't want to make it sound like Luka handed this accomplishment to Gafford, it still requires some incredible above the rim finishing and good shot selection, but I also don't think it's a coincidence that he fell short when he did. A lot of these are straight up free points, and in looking at the end result of these absurd percentages, it's easy to look past the process of Luka time and time again tricking the defense into leaving him open. So yeah, I think it's safe to say that no matter how you position your bigs, no matter how the rest of the defense rotates behind the play, Luka is pretty much always going to destroy drop coverage. As a result, I feel he probably gets hedged more than any other ball handler. Like here you see that big meet him right off the screen, and without a third defender it's more easy points for Gafford. The natural counter to these more aggressive coverages is the quick pocket pass, and more times than not he'll create a 4 on 3 advantage for one of his teammates to attack. And I want to make it clear that when I say pocket pass, I mean he'll thread the needle through seemingly impossible windows. The timing, accuracy, and velocity are all on another level. It's not just the pocket pass though, remember he has the size of a forward so in the event that he can't get to the bounce, that height still gives him access to angles over the top. This one leads to another layup, and it's important to keep in mind that just because Luka's seeing an aggressive coverage does not at all mean his scoring is no longer a threat. 
This time he splits two on a drive. Turner's more worried about the lob, so he basically walks into a layup. To avoid these numbers advantages, the natural reaction by a defense is to switch. If the timing is off by even a fraction of a second, there's that pocket pass as the possession ends in a dunk. Say the switch is timed right, and there isn't a slip, but the big is slow to get out, then we're back to square one with the outside shooting. And if the big does close that space on a switch, now it's that James Harden thing with Luka playing one-on-one -on -one against a favorable matchup. On the season, Luka's leading the entire NBA at about 12 points a game in the pick and roll, and he's doing so on an incredibly efficient 1.07 points per possession, good for the 92nd percentile. You could make the argument that he's the best scorer in the NBA coming off of screens, which makes it even crazier to think that he might just also be the best scorer in the NBA without a screen. He's once again first at 8 points a game in isolation while scoring 1.1 points per possession, so a phenomenal combination of volume and efficiency. When going to work one-on-one, -on -one, what defenders have to worry about most is his ability to change speeds. There really isn't a defender who can stay in front of him, then when help comes he'll slam the brakes while using his strength to create separation. The way he controls his body and momentum is second to none. You have the initial burst as he gets his defender on his hip, only to come to a complete stop and actually step backwards which leaves him with an open floater. Here it is again. He gets the step on his defender, decelerates while using a shoulder bump, but this time it's an up fake as he steps through for a chance at 3 points. In other words, it's really difficult to keep him from touching the paint seemingly whenever he wants meaning that he's often going to draw some added help around the rim, to which he'll showcase some more of that brilliant passing as he creates an open look. And it really doesn't matter where that help comes from, he's capable of taking advantage. This time it's from up top, or behind him, which of course means he'll throw a bullet over his head right into the hands of a shooter for a warm-up three. This ability to pressure the rim is elevated by the fact that he's such a good off-the-dribble three-point shooter. He's taking over 8 attempts a game, while nobody else is even over 7, and he's made 36.5% of them. When accounting for factors like difficulty and versatility, those are some pretty ridiculous marks. He'll leverage the threat of his drives to create these shots. Here, it's the hanging right-hand hesitation that he'll often take the first step out of, but he can also use it to pull back into a long-range jumper. And here's another example of that same move. He appears to be starting a drive, hangs that hesitation dribble, then it's the one-of-one -one deceleration as he generates a ton of space. So just like in the pick and roll, this leads to another game of cat and mouse. Is it a drive? Is it a pull-up three? By the time he's setting it up, it's probably too late. And it's all made possible by some truly absurd difficult shot making from all over the floor. You'll have possessions where it feels like whoever's guarding him played perfect defense, the shot clock's running low, and he just snatches the soul out of the opposing team with a stupid make. That of course means a lot of times you'll see defenders either load up early or commit to a double team. Then it's right back to the quick processing and ability to read the floor as he finds the open man every time. There isn't a single pass he's uncomfortable making. Here he draws two early, splits through them with a lengthy stride while staring down the weak side corner, only to hook it over his head without looking right on target as Hardaway has a free three points. Here's another one where he draws a second defender early from the middle of the floor, and as he looks to the wing, Nemhard starts shifting up, which he counters with a perfectly placed skip pass that results in another corner three. Most of these aggressive on-ball coverages are designed to leave the corner open for a brief moment, but because Luka's such a ridiculous skip passer, he's going to capitalize on those opportunities more than any other player in the league. And it isn't just the corners. If your plan is to get the ball out of his hands before he can start his attack, every off-ball defender better execute their coverage to perfection especially when they're getting into some set action. All it takes is one miscue and Luca's finding one of his teammates for a layup. I'd say the biggest problem when it comes to game planning for Luca, though, is that he feels like a mismatch for every single position. Against bigger defenders, they have to worry about him taking them off the dribble, which leaves him with more space to utilize the three ball. But against quicker defenders who can apply a bit more pressure, that's when you'll see him use his size and strength as he just forces his way to the paint. 
or that's when he'll turn his back to the basket and play out of the post, where he once again showcases a vast amount of ways to score. They'll often set him up on an open side, where he not only has the strength to back his way in close, but also the timing and footwork to spin in either direction and finish. I'd say his go-to move is this turnaround fade over his right shoulder, which is why when he sets up on the right side, a second defender will usually try to either help or double from the middle. Sometimes you'll see him shoot right through it for a trip to the line, but like clockwork, it's the passing that defenses have to worry about when helping. Gordon only thinks about stepping over, which is all it takes for Kyrie to catch and shoot an open three. And when it's a more designed coverage, with a second defender loading up early from the weak side, it's those long-range skip passes that lead to corner triples. All that's to say, I'm not sure we've ever seen a player who's better at creating offense with the ball in his hands. He's got the counters to every single pick and roll coverage, he's a walking mismatch in isolation, both out on the perimeter and in the post, he utilizes all three levels, there isn't a pass he can't make. I mean truly, if you were to make a checklist of the ideal on-ball player, he'd fit the mold to a T. And I think most people have realized this by now, it's the off-ball game that turns people away. I get it, and I'm not going to try to sell you on the idea that he's some high-level off-ball savant, but I do think he brings some skills to the table that tend to get overlooked. Primarily, it's the outside shooting. We're now approaching a pretty decent sample of him punishing defenses off the catch. It's never really been a part of his game before this year, but about two attempts a game comes out to over 100 total, and he's hit 41.6%. If you're not convinced, including last year, he's attempted 184 at a 39% clip, so I think it's safe to say at this point that he's at least a good catch-and-shoot option. And when spotting up on the perimeter, he shows great instincts for filling out space or relocating to make himself an available target as he sets up these opportunities. Not just that, but Dallas has also implemented some actions that are designed to get him free for off-ball jumpers. This time it's a flare screen, and because he's comfortable shooting from range, Miami's coverage doesn't really work. And on this one, it's a pin down from the corner, which he takes advantage of by mimicking the movement pattern of a high-level shooter to find some space deep on the wing. The biggest threat, though, is that due to this increase in spot-up shooting, he's gonna draw hard closeouts, meaning that when he attacks, it's right back to the driving game, and the defense has no answer for that. The way he's operated off-ball has been a huge factor in making the Kyrie pairing work as well as it has. I actually did an entire separate video breaking down the dynamic between those two if you're interested, and he's made some changes in his game this year that get overlooked. Not just the added off-ball shooting, but also the way he's played with pace, as Dallas has made it more of a point of emphasis. It really all comes back to his half-court mastery with the ball, though. Year after year, the Mavs have an elite half-court offense, regardless of who you put around him, and the manner in which he can dissect any defense in so many different ways can only be described as basketball genius. If you enjoyed this breakdown, make sure to drop a like, subscribe, and turn my post notifications on to be first on more content. If you're interested in my more in-depth research, make sure to check out my website and social media profiles. You can find those links in the description. Feel free to let me know down in the comments what you think of Luca. As always, I hope you all have a great day, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.